New York, Friday, May 14, 1948. The United Nations General Assembly is in special session. Opposing the United Nations' decision to partition Palestine are the Arab states led by Syria's Faris el Khoury. The Jewish representatives on the other side are waiting for their hour of destiny. The minutes of Britain's mandate are ticking to an end, but the 58 member nations are still deliberating over the future of the Holy Land. Here's Malik of Lebanon, who wants the United Nations to keep hands off. Duggan of Great Britain and Trig Valley. There is no decision even as the deadline runs out. But in Tel Aviv, for the Jews of Palestine, it is a time for decision, a time to mold history for themselves. A new nation is being born. In the first Jewish city, Tel Aviv, their first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, proclaims the independent Jewish state. British rule is at an end. The Jewish democratic state begins its new life in the ancient homeland of the Jews. This is what they have waited for. This is what they have prayed for. Israel, they have named their state. And the new citizens of Israel cheer the men who have signed the Jewish Declaration of Independence. They leave the hall, then Gurion first. Then Goldie Meyerson, woman member of the new Council of State and Foreign Minister Moshe Shertok. To look on this scene of rejoicing, one might not guess. On the morrow, enemy bombs will begin to fall. Chaim Weizmann becomes Israel's first president. Minutes later, electrifying news. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. Across the United States, May 14th is a day of celebration. Within minutes after the declaration, in New York, Washington, Detroit, friends of Israel are singing and dancing in the streets to greet the historic moment. In the nation's capital, the festivities go on outside Israel's legation. In London, home of the British colonial office, there is rejoicing at the Jewish agency building. But nowhere else, perhaps, does the news mean as much as in the infamous DP camps of Europe. Here, survivors of the former Nazi murder mills are waiting. For the internees of Cyprus, it is also zero hour. For months and years, in misery and squalor, these gallant men and women who braved Britain's sea blockade have waited behind barbed wire. Now at least the very young and the very old may sail away. The last refugees to leave under the white paper quota system of the expiring British mandate head for the Holy Land. The flag of Israel now flies openly from the Kedma, as once it did unrecognized from the Exodus, the unafraid. It sails for the new country with an all-Jewish crew. of Ben-Gurion's voice ring out in the Tel Aviv Square, other refugees from the DP camps of Europe return in triumph. These are the first to arrive as free citizens of the new state. Hundreds of thousands more will follow. They are home. A dream of centuries is near fulfillment. Free return to their ancestral land. But around them there are ominous portents, the sights and sounds of war. Israel is under attack from all fronts. The five nations of the Arab League, in defiance of the United Nations' decision, have declared war on the little republic. Jerusalem is besieged. Supplies of food and water cut off by Transjordan's Arab Legion. The new state is born in fire. On its borders, the regular armies of five Arab states are massed, poised for the invasion. Jewish civil defense guards check all transportation and screen all passengers. The heroic
heroic defenders of Jerusalem organized to meet the ever-growing threat to their city. For a long time, they had lived on intimate terms with the invaders' cunning warfare. The bomb cleverly concealed in the house wiring, or in a military truck touched off by the self-starter. Here, an ambulance wantonly attacked. Many were the sacred scrolls rescued from burning synagogues. And today, the invaders wait to enter Jerusalem's old city. King Abdullah of Transjordan and his British trained and equipped Arab Legion. And at their head, Brigadier John Glubb. The war in this one small battle sector halts while an Arab offers a child a plaything, a hand grenade. Inside these walls, a handful of 200 Haganah defenders fought against overwhelming odds. This was their corregidor, and still the fight goes on. British John Glubb, surnamed Pasha, self-appointed Arabian knight, enters the old city to survey his conquest. Pasha is well satisfied with what he sees. The sacking of old Jerusalem, sacred to three great faiths of the world, is not new. During 33 centuries of existence, it has been besieged and invaded innumerable times. But Jerusalem's destruction this time defied a decision taken by the United Nations to keep the historic city an international trust. The new modern city, with its 100,000 Jews, remains firmly in Jewish hands. The Pasha's minor victory will make good headlines in the capitals of the world. In another part of Palestine, an army is in training, the world's youngest, the Haganah. Yesterday, an underground striking force. Today, Israel's army of defense. Among them are the toughest fighters, the Palmach, the Israeli commandos. In Israel today, all able-bodied men and women between 18 and 35 are under arms. They will remain so until the threat to the Jewish state is removed and the United Nations decision to create that state has been respected. Like the Maccabees of old, parades for the first time officially and in the open. Marching down the streets of modern Jerusalem, they are the good lifeblood and sinew of the Jewish state, the strong right arm of Israel. Surrounded by enemies, with her supply of arms cut off from almost every part of the world, Israel forges its own steel gauntlet for its strong right arm. The tanks and armored trucks start rolling from its own improvised assembly line. Even the buses must be armored in the armed camp that is Palestine. For these people live on a battlefield. Their children go to school through no man's land. They ride to work amid the whine of enemy snipers' bullets. These troops are a reminder that their declaration of independence was no empty scrap of paper. Since the day of the Arab invasion, these fighting men have kept their borders intact. Not one foot of ground has been lost on any front. This they have done alone. Haganah's strength was tested and not found wanting. Castell was the climax in the Battle of the Roads, the key to Jerusalem's supply line. Castell was won. Then came the rout of Arab armies at Mishmar Haimek. In rapid succession, Tiberias and Haifa. They fight on, fight to keep the lifelines open. Most have had to give up their homes and farms to defend their country. Here, for the first time since Roman conqueror Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 71 AD, Israel is reborn. 
It is here in Israel today that the men and women of this new state are writing with their very lives the most glorious page in their long and gallant history.